Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you again for taking the time to join us this evening for our Saints Talk, uh, short presentations and lectures by leading members of the academic community on subjects that we hope are of general interest. My name is David Williams, and I look after the alumni and supporter relationship with St Andrews, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome you this evening and to introduce you to Professor William Austin. Uh, Professor Austin, Bill, is Professor in the School of Geography and Sustainable Development at the University and indeed was the first head of that department. His research focus is directed primarily at reconstructing past climate change from marine records, with particular recent focus on so-called blue carbon resources that links the potential of carbon ecosystems and their sediments to store vast qualities of quantities of carbon that would otherwise contribute to climate change as greenhouse gas emissions. Bill will talk for about 20 or 25 minutes and then he will take questions afterwards. If you do want to ask a question, you can do so through the team's taskbar. Please don't put your full name on it as for data protection reasons, I won't be able to publish it. And we'll aim to finish about 10 to six. And now over to Professor Austin. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, David, and many thanks for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be able to give this uh, talk uh, this evening. And I was flattered to be asked and uh, particularly flattered to be called a, a leading figure in the university. So thanks for that, David. Um, my, my talk this evening is really focused on a current issue. It's climate change, it's people and it's biodiversity. But before I begin, I wanted to acknowledge my research group here at St Andrews. I work in uh, geography and sustainable development, but also collaborate through the Scottish Oceans Institute. So there's a team of researchers uh, behind me. Uh, much of this research, of course, is, is based on some of their work. And also at the bottom there, this year in particular, thinking about six undergraduate uh, research dissertation students and some of the challenges uh, that we're facing together and of course all facing at the moment uh, with this pandemic. So uh, 2021 in many ways has been described as a super year and it will be the year when the UK hosts the climate change conference in Glasgow in November but it's also the year when the Convention on Biological Diversity, the World Economic Forum, the United Nations and so on convene to discuss some of these global challenges. So in many ways, this is a very timely opportunity to focus on these nature based solutions. I also wanted to, in reaching out to alumni this evening, acknowledge um, the contribution that Tony Edwards, who passed away shortly before Christmas, had made to the school. He was a great friend to the University of St Andrews, and I'm particularly grateful uh, to Tony for some of the support uh, that he showed many of us uh, as we transitioned to become a school of geography and sustainable development. And it was a great pleasure to me to be leading the school through that transition period. Uh, Tony himself helped us launch a new research centre within the school as well. OK, so uh, what do I mean by nature based solutions? I've got this wonderful, uh, I hope quite uh, straightforward, intuitive diagram that a good friend of mine at the University of Aberdeen, Pete Smith, has shared with me. Nature based solutions uh, driven through the biodiversity of our planet allow us to think about the way in which we can protect, restore, manage and even create new habitats. So in this way, people can work with nature. And when we do this in the right way, uh, we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We can control for flooding and erosion of soils. We can drive uh, global cooling. Of course, the world is warming at the present day. We can work more effectively to gain food and water security. Uh, we can create new uh, livelihoods and opportunities. So this is the idea at the moment of the um, green recovery plan. And of course, uh, we can shape and protect cultural values. And all of these themes 
connect through uh, to sustainable development, which of course is one of our key programs now in the school at St Andrews. So I've taken this um, quotation from the Leaders Pledge for Nature. The UK government is partly leading on this. We will redouble our efforts to end traditional silo thinking. That's music to our ears in sustainable development, where we cross the disciplines uh, in the university. We'll address the interrelated and interdependent challenges of biodiversity loss, land, freshwater and ocean degradation, deforestation, desertification, pollution and climate change in an integrated and coherent way ensuring accountability and robust and effective review mechanisms and lead by example through action in our own country. So this is uh, quite a challenge uh, that we've set ourselves. And of course, we will be reviewing our uh, progress towards these goals uh, when global leaders meet in Glasgow in November this year. Now, uh, the reason I've chosen the topic today is that I belong to a COP26, that's the climate negotiations that are happening in Glasgow, a network of university researchers. And we've been preparing a briefing paper for the UK Cabinet Office, just about to go to them. It's, it's with DEFRA at the moment. It's called Nature-Based Solutions for climate change, people and diversity. And in this paper, in this policy briefing, we argue that investments in nature-based solutions should meet four high-level principles. First of all, of course, we're not advocating an alternative to decarbonizing our economy. These need to be accompanied by swift, deep emission cuts. We should also encompass protection, restoration and the sustainable management of a wide range of ecosystems on land and in the sea. So I'm very pleased to have uh, argued that we need to do this at sea as well. They must be designed with and for local communities. We need to engage with the people who can look after these places and they must deliver measurable benefits for biodiversity. So some of these things are quite challenging to do. And if you're wondering, the photograph is from the head of Loch Fine, um, taken on New Year's Eve in 2019. And that's a salt marsh in the foreground. So nature-based solutions uh, can help us uh, tackle uh, societal challenges if we work with nature. This is an example of a managed landscapes in the Highland of uh, Scotland. It's the Allerdale Wilderness Reserve. And here we see uh, a landowner working uh, not towards the traditional um, shooting and, and other types of activities of the Highland estates, but actually exploring ways in which nature-based solutions can help protect the existing ecosystems, help restore degraded ecosystems and help uh, provide carbon storage within these uh, landscapes and habitats. And of course, this creates opportunities uh, for wildlife as well. So these sorts of initiatives are starting to take shape. But we're still exploring our way into and through at the opportunities to do this effectively. The other point, of course, is that we need to implement uh, nature based solutions across a wide range of ecosystems. Now, I've chosen coastal wetlands here uh, because these are the systems that I work on. But one of the things that we need to uh, keep in mind here is that this land is often used for other purposes. So, for example, if we have conflicts with uh, land use for agriculture, we're going to need to think about implementing strategies uh, that might compensate for these current land use practices in order to gain opportunities uh, for nature based solutions uh, in these environments. And of course, there is a finite amount of land available for these activities and a huge demand, of course, uh, particularly at the moment for carbon sequestration opportunities. These are both sites in Scotland 
uh, where we have been doing some field work, so we know something about the potential of these sites in coastal wetlands uh, to take up and store carbon. And I'll say a bit more about our research uh, as I go on. The other thing which I think is important to highlight and is sometimes forgotten is that commercial forestry using non-native species, of course, is uh, necessary for the production of timber and also for woody biomass, but it doesn't necessarily deliver the significant ch uh, change that we need for climate mitigation, and particularly, I think, for biodiversity uh, benefits. So we need to keep in mind that many of the commercial uh, initiatives around uh, forestry are not necessarily delivering uh, the right outcomes for these nature-based solutions at the moment. Investments, of course, is important. We can't expect uh, our government solely uh, to make these investments, and so we need to build the case uh, for capital investment in some of these schemes. So we need to meet high-level principles. First of all, I've said already, we can't think of these as alternatives. Uh, to decarbonising the economy. That would simply be a, uh, a cop-out. They should encompass protection, restoration, sustainable management, and we've talked about this already. We've designed these for local communities, and they have to give measurable benefits. Now, this is uh, one of the challenges, of course, that we face, that in terms of developing the robust metrics, beyond the existing woodland and peatland carbon metrics that we do have in place, it's quite difficult to assess the value of a wide range of nature-based solutions for carbon, biodiversity, and human well-being. So one of the questions is, how should we do this? And uh, again, with the global frameworks and agreements that we have, these are also uh, tending not to be very well aligned with each other. So the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that will uh, convene in Glasgow in November actually focuses on the climate mitigation aspects, whereas the Convention on Biological Diversity would have a much stronger uh, focus on the uh, biodiversity gains. And at the moment, we don't have good mechanisms to make all of these uh, things work together. So in the UK, scaling up restoration and protection of key ecosystems requires better protection of natural habitats in our planning system. We need to reform agricultural and forestry payments to better support actions that benefit both climate and biodiversity. And uh, perhaps there'll be a question on European exit and opportunities uh, to review uh, those payment schemes as they might evolve now. Thirdly, we need better connections between habitats across landscapes, and we need to build on some of these emerging ideas for nature recovery networks. Can't think of these systems in isolation. And of course, we need to make it compulsory, uh, our group has argued, to build nature-based solutions into future planning development. So well-designed new financing mechanisms, including tax incentives and public subsidies for ecosystem stewardships, are going to help us meet the four nature-based uh, solution guidelines. And these will help support climate change mitigation and biodiversity. Now, there's be recently been a Royal Society review um, by Supatha Dasgupta, the Dasgupta re Review on Biodiversity making the case that currently only about 3% of funding is, is targeted at biodiversity. And so there are opportunities to rethink the way that we finance uh, some of these globally important challenges. The team have also argued that a new independent governing body is needed to ensure that the environmental integrity of these markets can be maintained both domestically and globally. Okay, so I'm going to switch now to uh, a little bit of the research that we do at St Andrews within my own research group. 
we had to focus on salt marsh habitats and we broadly refer to these as blue carbon habitats. So if I'm talking about blue carbon, I'm broadly going to be referring to these coastal vegetated habitats um, that we have here in Scotland and around the world. Now, the first point to make is that the oceans are an incredibly important part of the global carbon cycle. They cycle about 83% of the carbon carbon uh, it, within the ocean system. Yet these coastal habitats only cover less than 2% of the total ocean area. Yet when we look at the carbon that's sequestered in these coastal habitats, it's about 50% of ocean carbon. So we immediately realize, I think, that these are very effective places for carbon sequestration. So that's the key point. Uh, if we're looking for, if I could put it this way, bang for our buck in terms of managing um, nature, these could be very good places to focus on. Now, had I taken a census of the audience at the start of this lecture, I'm, I think many of you would have argued with me that uh, forest systems are incredibly important for carbon sequestration. And of course, they are at the global scale. But when we normalize uh, these forest systems against uh, these coastal uh, blue carbon habitats of so mangroves in the tropics, tidal marshes, seagrass meadows here in the UK, we actually see that the sequestration rates are significantly higher in these blue carbon habitats. So again, area normalized, these are very effective places, highly productive and very effective at, at sequestering carbon. So taking up some of that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, helping us to mitigate the effect of CO2 as a greenhouse gas. The other point is that if we look at the above ground, uh, the living biomass in light blue and the below ground soil organic carbon, in these different habitat types. Again, the blue carbon habitats jump out at us, again, area normalized per hectare here. They are very good places for storing the carbon that is uh, sequestered in those habitats. So the soils are building up long-term stores of carbon that can last for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And this is, in a way, the double-edged sword here, that if these habitats are therefore not well protected and managed, they can very quickly release greenhouse gases back to the atmosphere. So we, we, you know, there are two things here. There's the permanence and there's the additionality of having very effective uh, habitats for carbon sequestration. Now, in a UK context, a uh, lot of text here, but the key point is that one of the few habitats in the UK context that's currently uh, available for us to include within land use, land use change and forestry sectors is coastal wetlands. And this is one of the only sectors for the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory that could be a net sink with scope to offset emissions from other sectors. Now, again, I want to emphasize that we're not going to suddenly reduce all of our greenhouse gas emissions. So working with nature to find places where nature, if it's protected, restored, well-managed, new habitats created, can help draw down CO2 is going to be very important to us. And this is part of our commitment in the UK uh, to net zero emission targets by 2050. And as you may know, uh, Scottish government are aiming for net zero by 2040, 2045. So, uh, you know, we have an opportunity here with these coastal wetlands to do something quite uh, unique at this present moment in time. The inclusion of salt marshes, this is my daughter Becky uh, in October this year, a half term helping with some field work in our little family COVID bubble. The inclusion of salt marshes in the UK greenhouse gas inventory 
would, I would argue, provide an important first step necessary uh, to account for, protect, and therefore restore these long-term climate, climate stores. And we could realize their potential uh, for climate change mitigation. So this is a really exciting time in terms of the research that we're doing on these habitats around the UK. This is up in uh, the Dorna Firth, if any of you are wondering where we are. And uh, even further north now, um, I, I'm leading a UKRI, a, a UK Research Council project. It's funded by NERC, the Natural Environment Research Council, uh, five partner institutions across the UK. And we're looking at carbon storage in these intertidal environments. Uh, this is Simone Regal, myself, at the Kyle of Tongue up in Sutherland. Uh, with Ben Hope there in the background. And what we're doing here is collecting sediment cores. We take these back to the laboratory and we measure uh, the amount of carbon that's stored in these habitats. And we've been doing this around the UK to build up an understanding of the carbon stocks. Remarkably, uh, we didn't have a first order understanding of these stocks uh, for the UK. So this this is going to be a fairly fundamental uh, piece of research work. And uh, bottom right here, just to show you an example, this is, these are the marshes at Wicktown on the Solway coastline in southwest Scotland. And the maps show the vegetation types. We can then uh, work out the carbon content associated with each of these habitats and translate that on the right hand side into a stock estimate of carbon across the entire marsh. And what we find is that some of these marshes uh, hold a huge uh, quantity of carbon. And of course, that carbon has been accumulating, as I've said previously, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So the frameworks that we have for greenhouse gas, uh, climate change mitigation accounting, mean that we could translate this knowledge uh, with uh, UK government approval into an accounting mechanism for our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so, you know, we're moving ever closer, I would say, to a point where we should be able in a few years time to incorporate these habitats into the greenhouse gas inventory. I should say, and the cartoon on the bottom left just highlights that, of course, there is a wealth of interesting research to understand how these systems function, the inputs, the outputs of carbon, carbon accounting, and, of course, ultimately, the way we might manage these habitats to improve their potential for carbon storage. This, of course, would be the additionality that we need to demonstrate for these habitats. So a final thought, uh, blue carbon offers an emerging opportunity to support the UK government and of course devolved administrations in what I would call a political commitment to a new nature government. And this is an exciting time. We're hearing more about nature-based solutions now. It's on the agenda for COP26 that we will move towards a new nature covenant that tackles the twin issues of climate change and biodiversity loss through the protection of these habitats. So some of the work that we've been really pleased to support has been citizen science based. We've been reaching out. I lead a project with university support called Blue Carbon Quest. Uh, we've been a little disrupted, of course, by the pandemic for the past year. But we've been going out to local primary schools, getting them to help us collect samples. We measure the samples in the laboratory and then uh, send the data back to them and they have their own dot on the map to understand how we build up this uh, nationwide picture of the importance of these habitats. And it's been absolutely fantastic here in Scotland to get uh, ministerial support for some of these initiatives uh, through the Scottish Government. OK, so I wanted to end. I didn't want to take up too much of your time this evening. 
uh, and I, I would like to uh, perhaps have some questions if there are some. Just to bring this uh, to the World Economic Forum, there's a report by uh, McKinsey and, and consultants recently uh, this January on nature and net zero, looking at the economics of how this might work. And I, I have a diagram here that I, I just wanted to introduce as a thought process and an opportunity uh, to think about what we might collectively do in terms of meeting some of these challenges. So the diagram shows uh, essentially a timeline running from uh, left to right. As we move towards the right hand side of this diagram, we're trying to uh, reduce the net emissions of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the reason for this is that the scientific evidence from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, has argued that the safe limit for global warming should be 1.5 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. Now, this means that to achieve uh, a warming of no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade, uh, two degrees uh, from the Paris Agreement, of course, that we have to reduce the greenhouse gases that are driving uh, this warming of our planet. And to do this, of course, we can reduce our emissions through uh, the ways that I've discussed, but uh, nature-based solutions can also contribute. And this, I think, is quite an exciting opportunity for us. We see that uh, nature-based solutions through avoidance or reduction can contribute by avoided deforestation. So we can protect existing forests and existing systems such as blue carbon habitats, mangrove forests, salt, salt marshes and so on. Protect them and they will continue to function if they're healthy in a way that draws down this excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Of course, that's part of a cycle, but if we have healthy habitats, if we avoid degradation, then this will contribute. So that's certainly something that we ought to be doing. And then I think more excitingly is, is the red bar, um, which is that we can contribute to net emissions reduction through enhanced removal and sequestration of uh, carbon dioxide and this is through reforestation and what we might do of course in planting forests in uh, developing uh, new habitats uh, protecting habitats managing them in a better way is we could contribute to the um, red bar through these so-called negative emissions the great thing about this is that if we make investments now, these investments will grow year on year and will continue to help reduce uh, the excess CO2 and help us work towards uh, these um, emission reduction pathways. So on a lighthearted note, uh, some of you, if you're alumni of geography, may recognize with me here holding hands on a Highland field trip, uh, Dr. Mike Kesby, great colleague, a great friend, and a critical human geographer. But we're communing with nature here, uh, actually studying uh, native uh, woodland forests uh, up in the Highlands of Scotland. So I think there are opportunities to think about our relationship with nature. And I hope uh, in this brief presentation that I may have uh, stimulated uh, some discussion, which I'd be very pleased to answer any questions. If there isn't time uh, this afternoon, then by all means, uh, please, please do email me. I'd be very happy to follow up by email uh, with anyone. OK, and with that, David, I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Phil. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, I'm going to go straight to a, a question from uh, Stefan, who's an MA, uh, uh, from 2005. 
uh, he, he praises you for the beautiful landscapes of Bonnie, Scotland, though he didn't mention the photo with Mike and the tree. Um, Stefan asks, I was wondering whether assigning an economic value to ecosystems and natural resources is so fundamentally necessary, referencing the McGinsey publication you spoke of, uh, which speaks of natural capital as the planet's balance sheet, etc. It is clear that natural resources such as fresh water, fresh air, ecosystems are worth far more than oil, diamonds, etc. Taking a look at the future for our security, we know that they are crucial and should be considered invaluable. So must we continue to speak in the language of economics when with whose models have failed to create a sustainable global economy and system? OK, thank you, Stefan. That that's uh, quite a challenging question and, and one which I think is uh, is often asked. It's certainly one in sustainable development here at St Andrews, which we have asked of colleagues working in the field of environmental economics. And I followed uh, some of those conversations over the years. My own view, and I, I would take you back to the Stern review of a few years ago, which I think was something of a tipping point where the economics of climate change were really brought to the fore of uh, the debate. And I think what the Stern Review did was it highlighted the economic cost of not acting uh, to mitigate against climate change. In a similar vein, I think the Das Gupta Review which has recently been published by the Royal Society that looks at the economics of biodiversity will in time, I think, help us really appreciate the value of these natural systems. So uh, I hear what you're saying. I completely agree with you. And uh, those photographs, uh, I think, were intended uh, to show what drives me, you know, in terms of perhaps an emotional response in a way to the uh, landscapes and the habitats in which we work. But I, I, I do think that this can be helpful and I think within the economic system in which we operate, uh, this can be a valuable approach. Uh, but yes, I, I, I do take your point. Thanks, Bill. We've had a couple of questions along the same line, uh, which is fundamentally, um, is salt marsh restoration or any of the other um, approaches to carbon capture you've discussed compatible with the fact of sea level rise? Oh, yes, thank you. That, that's a great question. You know, one of the challenges we face is who will pay for these restoration schemes? we are likely to uh, require quite large um, coastal realignment schemes in the future. Uh, we know that sea levels of course are rising and the very driver of sea level rise is global warming, which itself of course is being driven by these greenhouse gas emissions. And if, if we are to invest in large schemes, large management interventions, which help lock away carbon, then there is the issue of what's called permanence. So the additionality, uh, which would allow you to count for the carbon gains comes from the management implementation itself. But of course, the permanence issue is, is a key question for investment. So I think what we're going to have to do is look at our coastlines, not as fixed features as we have for so long. And of course, this is in the face of sea level rise. This is driving at coastal squeeze. And this is why we're losing uh, some of these habitats at such, a, such alarming rates. So in fact, these coastal wetlands are the planet's most threatened habitats. So we will need to realign our coastlines. Of course, that won't be appropriate everywhere. And, uh, you know, we, we need to be thinking, I think, carefully about where it would be appropriate, where we have land available uh, to create these schemes. But yeah, the, the issue of permanence, I think, is a key one, and it's particularly important, I think, at the moment in terms of investor confidence. 
you know, that there are billions of dollars to be spent in this area, but we, we do need to tackle that issue of, of permanence. But I think that will come through uh, realignment mechanisms for our coastlines. This is a question uh, from Kathy. Uh, Bill, great talk, thanks. Can you comment on the likely contribution we could achieve in Scotland by creation of new salt marsh, e.g. through managed realignment versus better management of existing habitats to remove pressures and ensure effective continued carbon capture and storage? Thanks, Cathy. I mean, that, that's a great question. And um, I'd, I'd like to start really by highlighting, first of all, that nature-based solutions provide potentially highly cost-effective um, means to address uh, climate change and, of course, uh, the benefits they bring from biodiversity loss. So in our coastal wetlands, I think one of the things uh, that we would like to better understand is whether or not quite small interventions, uh, for example, the blocking of uh, drainage channels, which does occur on some salt marsh surfaces to gain marginal improvements in uh, the pasture. If we were to block, i.e. to re-wet the salt marsh, we could do that um, at very low cost, but we might actually find that that's a very cost-effective way at scale to deliver quite large uh, carbon benefits and uh, of course additional biodiversity benefits. So I think one of the ways to do this, I don't have an answer for you, uh, but I have a gut feeling that we ought to start with these um, fairly simple interventions and this will be the easiest way to make progress. And I think one of the ways this may happen is actually tied into European exit. So as we come out of the common agricultural policy, um, there are new opportunities. For, for example, in England, we have ELM, and there may be tiered based approaches uh, to fund um, these sorts of actions as payments uh, to farmers, for example, who may be using this as uh, grazing land at the present time. So, uh, I think I think Kathy, the point I would make is that uh, small interventions are probably the way to start. We need some experimental sites where we can do more of this work and understand the actual gains. Um, we don't, you know, we can model those at the moment, but we don't actually know quite how much gain we can obtain. And then, of course, the large schemes are going to be uh, very expensive and will need to be uh, designed with other benefits in mind. So flood protection, um, migratory bird uh, opportunities, uh, other sorts of recreational opportunities and the additionality of the blue carbon. Uh, I think that's where some of these large scales, uh, scale uh, schemes are going to come in. We've had uh, uh, we've had a lot of questions actually, and, and several on on agricultural policy, which we'll come on to in a moment. Uh, this is from Joanna, just asking uh, pertaining to your last answer: Are there any national guidelines for nature-based solutions projects yet? Um, yes, we, we do have some uh, some of these guidelines. Uh, nature Scott, for example, here in Scotland would have. Uh, of course, nature based uh, policies. Um, we have, for example, in our iconic peatlands in Scotland, and I, I'd, I'd like to use the analogy of peatlands um, for our, our coastal wetlands. The soils are very peaty in these salt marsh habitats, and uh, like the peatlands, um, you know, we have a, a peatland code now, we have a peatland action plan for Scotland, and we've very recently, within the past few weeks, brought uh, peatlands formally under the greenhouse gas inventory for the UK. And of course, that top-down policy driven by the net zero agenda is so fundamentally important as a policy driver 
Um, so yes, yeah, so I think we have these mechanisms and uh, we, we have, for example, opportunities to protect coastal wetlands. Quite a lot of them are protected. They're designated as uh, sites of special scientific interest, for example. But I, I think the payment mechanisms uh, that might come for uh, landowners for alternatives to agriculture are quite interesting. And we don't have blue carbon thinking in that framework yet. Um, and of course, if we go offshore, there's a there's a whole debate about what we're doing to our shelf seas and the carbon uh, that they store as well. So re related question uh, on on the policy agenda from Finley. Thanks for a great presentation. It would be great to hear your thoughts on the expansion of such spaces for commercial use, use of salt tolerant plants for food, fuel, materials, etc. Is it possible to balance commercial interests and operations with the creation of habitats and the continued sequestration of CO2? That, that's a really uh, great question. Uh, thank you, Finlay. I think yes, um, and there is actually a small startup um, that's looking at this. So um, they're looking to create coastal realignment flooding and grow high value um, crops which are salt tolerant. And of course that can be a way of generating uh, income from that um, reclaimed uh, land. Um, I think the difficulty there with some of these schemes is that the additionality as it's called in terms of the um, the gains for carbon are not yet well understood. And uh, you know, if you're using fertilizers on those soils, for example, uh, that there, there would be some other uh, greenhouse gas related issues that you would need to take in, into consideration. But I, I do think uh, this is an interesting area to look at and it may, may be uh, that there are some opportunities to develop some of these uh, schemes, um, particularly to create these uh, buffer zones in our coastal environment and to allow um, that inshore expansion of the coastal zone uh, and, to, and to look at agricultural opportunities. These tend to be quite high value crops. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not sure about the scalability of this proposition at the moment, but it's certainly something that's been looked at and, and talked about. Yeah. So a question uh, from Christina and, and, and also for others uh, who, are, who are watching who, who may be interested in exploring practical examples further, but from Christina, what are the examples of wetland restoration in process in Scotland or the UK you would point to? Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, that's that's a great uh, question. I'm currently uh, being commissioned by the UK Environment Agency uh, as an author for their new um, salt marsh restoration manual. So the Environment Agency have recognised um, the opportunity to develop um, quite large scale schemes. Uh, but there are small scale examples of this and in fact our own students uh, here at St Andrews through the School of Biological Sciences, I'm thinking in particular of uh, Professor David Patterson's research group, uh, colleagues such as Claire Peddy, who have worked uh, with local stakeholders, the Ministry of Defence I believe and um, the RNA to replant uh, local salt marshes. Now, of course, that's on a very small scale, um, but you know there are these sorts of schemes out there and there are these opportunities uh, to, I think, explore opportunities for coastal protection in particular. But uh, you know, we, we're ultimately going to need to scale up on these ambitions. And as I've said, I think some of the first things we need to do is look at the way that we're currently managing natural habitat uh, to gain those uh, blue carbon uh, winds and then to look at these larger scale coastal realignment opportunities.
we're, we're heading towards time. We've got a very large uh, number of uh, questions left over. So I'm just going to... Okay. David, just really quickly to come back, I realised I didn't fully answer Christina's question. Christina, whilst I think there are some examples on the Eden Estuary of attempts uh, to replant salt marsh, two of the best examples I could give you here in Scotland are at Skin Flats near Grangemouth and up at Nig and um, these near Cromarty. And these are both uh, Royal Society for the Pre protection of bird uh, schemes are quite um, significant realignment schemes and been very successful and we're doing a little bit of work uh, with the group at the uh, skin flat site to essentially a longitudinal study um, hopefully to understand some of the blue carbon gains there. Thanks Bill. I'm I'm just going to come on to a, a couple of final questions now, but just to tell everyone, we're going to put a link to the event survey in the chat. Um, if you if you do have the time to fill it in, it'd be very helpful in helping us um, shape the timings and the format of future events as well, and also to to, to feedback uh, to us and to Bill. So I've got two final questions, Bill. Um, one, a technical one, and then we'll move on to your hopes for uh, COP26, which is uh, which you mentioned in, in the talk. So first from Andy, what is it about the 2% coastal wetlands that enable them to sequester that 50% of ocean carbon? What's the, tech, the, the, the technicality of that? Well, Thanks, Andy. That that is a great question again. Um, te technically, these are highly productive, nutrient-rich environments. Um, they're well supplied with sediments, and they're places that trap sediments naturally. Um, so they're accreting quite rapidly. Uh, they're highly productive, and so the organic matter that's produced in situ uh, by the plant communities um, is also trapped within the soils. And because of the uh, high salinity and the presence of, I'm sorry, that's the dog just uh, woken up. Um, the sulfur uh, in seawater inhibits some of the bacterial uh, decay. And that means that in fact, um, there, well, you could think of this as a sort of pickling process, a little bit like our, water saturated peatlands. They're just very good places with low oxygen to preserve the organics. Um, and, of, you know, of course, you know, that's why they're so uh, important for us. Um, and as I've said, they are our most threatened habitats on the planet, um, partly because of uh, land reclamation and partly because uh, now of, of accelerated sea level rise. I'll, I'll move on to the to a final question now. Uh, what are your ambitions for COP26 uh, climate negotiations in Glasgow that's taking place in November? Okay, well, um, I, I think first of all, I I'm excited that nature-based solutions are on the agenda. I think part of our our role within the university is to raise ambition. And the UK government, Scottish government, are certainly uh, receptive uh, to the kinds of advice that we can provide. But of course, they need to focus on solutions. Net zero is a particular challenge. So my my hope is that uh, we would see blue carbon moving essentially from a theoretical um, idea in the UK to something which could be implemented into our national uh, greenhouse gas inventory. I should say that the university through its environmental sustainability board that's led by um, um, colleagues in the university and includes students um, has a COP26 facing uh, group and we're looking at opportunities to engage with our students in that process. The university hopes to be accredited as an observer organization at the climate negotiations. 
And personally, I'm involved in hosting a conference at the Royal Society of Edinburgh during COP26 on this blue carbon theme, and we will have policymakers engaged with us in that process. Thanks, Phil, and apologies to everybody. We, we've had a, a very large number of very interesting questions. I'm just going to read out Bill's uh, email address again. Uh, that's wena at standrews.ac.uk. St Andrews being hyphenated. Um, and as very kindly, Bill said that he would be happy to, to answer questions by email. Uh, so thanks on behalf of the alumni and supporter audience for, for that offer. Um, and thank you also for your talk, Bill. If you enjoyed this event, you can watch uh, some of our other Saints talks on our YouTube channel and you can uh, find out more about them by email, uh, Twitter, Instagram and via LinkedIn. The big event coming up uh, in the next couple of months is our alumni weekend on the 16th uh, to the 18th of April, which is going to be fully online this year, um, which also includes uh, this kind of quality of academic content. Uh, it's open to all, it's online, so we help or not only alumni, but other members of the St Andrews community will join us uh, for that. And, and once again, I'd like to, to thank Professor Austin for his time and sharing his research with all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs>